It's September 8th, 1936, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ollie, the Retrospectors. The Americans have Bigfoot, Scots have the Loch Ness Monster, and the Nepalese have the Yeti, all legendary beasties that have prompted many decades of searches and speculation. Australians, meanwhile, have the Yowie or the Bunyip, which is an ape-like creature from indigenous folklore. But we also have the Tasmanian tiger, an extinct marsupial which, despite the fact that the last known member died in captivity today in history in 1936, continues to be cited by members of the public to this day. Yeah, the death was noted by Hobart City Council in a committee meeting the following week, and the minutes state, efforts to be made by superintendent to obtain another tiger up to the value of £30, suggesting that at the time there was no consensus that the animal was yeah. indeed extinct and that the female that had died in Hobart Zoo was in fact an endling, the heartbreakingly cute term for a creature which is the last example oh. of its species. <laughs> Either not an awareness of that or a shame that that was the case, because only 59 days earlier, before this day, on July the 10th, 1936, the Tasmanian Parliament had passed legislation declaring the Tasmanian tiger an endangered species, prohibiting their killing. They knew there was an issue, but they just realised too late. Yeah, this last one was illegally captured by a trapper named Elias Churchill in May of 1936 and was secretly sold to the now-closed Beaumaris Zoo in Hobart, where she died of exposure just a few months later on the, the day that we're talking about. They'd left her out of her hutch and she just died in the elements because she got too cold. And part of the reason the sale wasn't recorded or particularly publicised by the zoo was because at the time ground-based snaring had been made illegal and Churchill could have been fined if they'd found out the way that he had brought this thing in. And so at the time no one really knew that this was going to be the last Tasmanian tiger to grace a zoo and in fact records suggest that people were still hunting for wild thylacines as they're called technically well after 1936. Well, actually, their full scientific name is Thylacinus sinocephalus, <laughs> which means dog-headed pouched one. Mm. If you've never seen a, a picture of a thylacine, that's quite a good description, isn't it? So pouch meaning like a kangaroo, they keep their young in a pouch. And dog-headed is right. They mm. look canine, yeah. but they're kind of stretched, like they're like a wolf, but their torso looks too long for the rest of them. And they've got a stripy back, which is where the tiger <laughs> illusion comes from. Yeah, they are part of a wider order of Australian marsupials called Dasyuromorphia, which includes the Tasmanian devil. Tasmanians love whimsy, don't they? Mm. Tasmanian devils, <laughs> Tasmanian tigers. And the nombat, the official mammal of Western Australia. All of the famous Australian marsupials, the ones you're thinking of, the koala, the kangaroo, the wallaby, they all belong to another order in the same family. Uh, the Tasmanian tiger was once found across the Australian mainland, Tasmania and New Guinea as well. And the story of its extinction is not one of tragic human exploitation up until the very end, at least. The <laughs> it's species... not entirely one of tragic entirely. human exploitation, everybody. <laughs> the main culprit, 3,500 years before European arrival, was the dingo, which had exterminated the Tasmanian tiger from Australia and New Guinea. And dingoes are interesting as of themselves because there is no consensus on whether they're just feral domestic dogs or a subspecies of dog or wolf. But either way, you know, the kind of squat little marsupials couldn't compete with the dingo when it came to hunting for the same prey. And so by the time Europeans arrived and colonised Australasia, Tasmania was the only place where the Tasmanian tiger still thrived. But they were still a pest and so farmers were hunting them and licensed to hunt them for a long time because they particularly preyed on lambs and that was annoying to people who were trying to raise sheep. The last one that was shot dead in the wild is thought to have happened in 1930 when a farmer called Wilfred Batty uh, saw this uh, thylacine that was prowling around his chicken sheds and shot it. He couldn't have known on this afternoon that this was the date that would go down in history as the very last Tasmanian tiger shot in the wild. But also he couldn't have thought he was doing anything unusual. I mean, mm. the point was that there'd been bounties put out on these animals for over a hundred years. As early as 1830, farmers were paying hunters who could prove that they'd killed a thylacine. And in 1888, the Tasmanian government themselves began paying people a bounty of one pound for killing a full-grown thylacine and 10 shillings for killing a thylacine pup. And 
It is a sort of scary animal if you're a farmer. It could open its jaws 120 degrees. There is some footage, so you can see that, and it's kind of amazing. (laughs) And you would want to keep your livestock safe from that. But there was this widely circulated photo showing a thylacine making off with a chicken. And I think that engendered a lot of thylacine hatred. Mm. There's now a theory that that could have been fake news. It was staged with a dead stuffed thylacine now obviously that's because you couldn't take a picture because they moved quickly but at the same time like it shows the power of an image doesn't it coupled Mm. with the fact people could make money by hunting these things Yeah, they were also tarred with the brush of being uh, sheep killers. But having now studied the skeletons and particularly the jaws of thylacines, it's now believed that they weren't strong enough. They couldn't have killed a sheep. Maybe they could have killed, you know, a kind of sickly little lamb. But they were being accused of basically, you know, savaging herds of sheep. So they did get extremely bad press. And it wasn't until the 1920s that there was finally a sense that thylacines needed to be protected. But it was too late by then. They, They were trying to breed them in captivity at this point. But those attempts didn't take off. And part of the problem was that there were hardly any thylacines in captivity. There was one in London Zoo that died in 1931, one in Melbourne Zoo that died in 1930, and a few, as we've alluded to, that kind of passed through Hobart Zoo. But most of them, you know, they they had relatively short lives in captivity. You get the sense, though, that by February in 1937, people had a strong suspicion that maybe the damage had been finally done and they had killed off the last of them because there was an article in The Examiner, which is a Launceston paper, which uh, said, has anybody seen a Tasmanian tiger lately? This is a question which the Animals and Birds Protection Board will shortly cause to be circulated through the state. Fears exist that this unique specimen of fauna may now be extinct. Mr. A.W. Burby said there was no reliable evidence that the Tasmanian tiger was now in existence. So even a year after this, people had started to get the sense that they weren't just not being seen because they had sort of retreated into the depths of the Tasmanian Tasmanian uh, forests, but because in actual fact, maybe they'd done the final deed. Nonetheless, there were plenty of skeletons and hides and taxidermied specimens, uh, including actually this last one, which was only rediscovered very recently. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And and that's because scientists realised they were dwindling, so they preserved as much as they could. And I was watching a video today from a museum in Victoria, which was showing that by chance, scientists had preserved the young from a mother's pouch in ethanol. Mm. So because of that, I mean, it really was by chance. There are lots of different fluids that a Victorian scientist might have put things in. But because they used ethanol, they've been able to extract the DNA, which uh, dangles the thrilling Jurassic Park possibility (laughs) of reviving the Tasmanian tiger. (laughs) Of us all being killed off by Tasmanian tigers on a rampage. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there have been serious efforts to research the feasibility of de-extincting the thylacine, particularly because it continues to cast a surprisingly large shadow in Australian culture, considering that to have seen one in real life, you would now have to be in your 90s and have been at Hobart Zoo in a very (laughs) short period in the 30s. Mm. The thylacine appears on the Tasmanian coat of arms, although the official animal of the state is unsurprisingly the Tasmanian devil and as the state logo on number plates. So, you know, there has actually been a lot of interest around the idea of could we bring the thylacines back to life, beginning with the advent of cloning technology in the 1990s. But, you know, even now, there is a three-year, 15 million Australian dollar project ongoing involving researchers from the University of Melbourne and a US company called Colossal Biosciences, which really sounds like something shady from a film. (laughs) The plan is to produce a live thylacine by 2032. That's amazing, but also mad, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, if they put all that money in preserving species that might still yet be extinct through mankind's intervention, that would be better spent, I feel. <laughs> well, there's also a simultaneous big money effort to try to confirm one of these so far unconfirmed sightings of live specimens that have been reported in the wild. And in 1983... What? I thought they were all dead! (laughs) Well, (laughs) okay, so in 1983, CNN's founding father, Ted Turner, raised the stakes by promising $100,000 US in exchange for proof of a thylacine's survival. He (laughs) later... Yeah, rich people are mad. (laughs) Yeah, well, he wasn't so mad that he didn't eventually revoke the offer, thinking that maybe he might be $100,000 out of pocket. But in 2017, 
2017, uh, Stuart Malcolm, who's a Tasmanian tour operator, began offering $1.75 million for any proof that Tasmanian tigers still exist. You get the sense that as a tour operator, this is a bit of a stunt to get old Stuart Malcolm onto the radar of international history podcasts like ours. <laughs> when you say Tasmanian tour operator, I just picture a tour operator who like screams and shouts incoherently at a bunch of tourists. <laughs> <laughs> and so another week of retrospecting ends but next week begins a day early at club retrospectors join us now to get an exclusive episode every sunday patreon.com slash retrospectors part of the acast creator network